Hello everyone and welcome back to another video about this 286 motherboard. I already tried to fix this board before. We removed the battery and we fixed corrosion along the way. And then one of the tantalum capacitors exploded and we had to replace this one as well. Unfortunately the board still doesn't work. I used a multimeter to measure all the dip sockets, the SIM sockets, that all pins are connecting to either the CPU or the chipset, and that all looks fine to me. Then I asked Tony from Tony359 if he had an idea, and he offered me to have a remote debugging session to have a look and compare with another board that he had to see if there would be something that maybe could lead to a solution, but so far all my attempts did fail. So what I want to do today is I want to have a look at logic chips, buffer chips that you can see distributed across the board. Here are another three and here are two more. All of these chips are part of the library of my programmer. So maybe we are lucky and we can find a faulty chip which would resolve all this issue we are having. The problem is that all these chips are soldered to the board and that is why I have some sockets here. So I am planning on taking out chip by chip, test it with a programmer, see if it's okay, then it goes back on the board with a socket. Additionally, since I made this video, I got new BIOS chips and they work. So I flashed the BIOS, I verified that they are reading correctly, and with those two BIOS chips in the board, the board posts, but it gets stuck exactly the same point like before. I also got memory chips for the dip sockets here. I populated all of them before, so here's just for one bank, the memory chips. Unfortunately, also this didn't make a difference. The board still stops at the same point. And then there is another socket here. This one here is a socket for the CPU. So yeah, I am planning to socket most of the ICs here, including the crystals, because then later on if I want to change the CPU and maybe I want to put a 286 rated for lower speed, I can just replace the crystal easily and plug in, let's say, a, what do we have, a 24 megahertz for a 12 megahertz CPU, or I just want to downclock it. I think I have uh, replacement crystals that we could try, but this is the plan. So I think I will jump now under the microscope and we will just start with logic chips. And I think I want to start with these logic chips here. And the reason is I have a feeling we have a problem somewhere with the address lines on the chipset. Maybe it is related to one of these chips. And of course, this one here is one other chip. I already looked this chip up. This is a hex inverter. It takes a signal and outputs the opposite. So if a logical one enters, it will output a logical zero and vice versa. So I guess I will jump now under the microscope and we are going to start desoldering those logic chips. But I also want to thank today's video sponsor, PCBWay. Are you in need of high quality PCBs for your next project? PCBWay offers top-notch PCB manufacturing, assembly and prototyping, all at affordable prices. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced engineer. And I can tell you that I'm a beginner. As you can see here, this is the current state of my 16MB SIM modules. I'm currently at revision 6.0 and every time I decided to make a PCB because it is much easier to have a prototyping PCB like this one and solder all the components on and test it in a real system. All for less than 10 US dollars shipped. And then you can go ahead and debug your circuits and hopefully at some point you will succeed and then you can distribute it to everybody who wants one. So I'm really happy that I have access to PCBWay services, which also include 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. And as a last teaser, this module almost works. So definitely check out PCBWay.com if you need a partner that can support you with your projects. Links are in the video description. So I decided to start with this chip. This is the chip that had corrosion on it. And it is the hex inverter that I mentioned before. This is a model that we can test with my programmer. I already checked this. So what I will do now is I will desolder the chip from the other side of the board and then we will see what it reports when we test it in the programmer. So I will desolder most of the chips off camera. I think it would be too boring. There are like, I think 12 or 14 of those logic ICs on the board. 
So yeah, let's try to keep that to a minimum and not show over and over the same thing. We all want to know if those chips are in working condition or not. Flux and then solder wick. My soldering iron is set to 330 degrees. And here is some solder wick. The problem is that the chips are also attaching from the top to those vias here. So if you look at the chip itself, where the small pin goes into the bigger pin, this part gets stuck on the vias here. So even if I remove the solder inside with a solder wig, this section is still attached to the via and it's almost impossible to get these chips out so i don't think a desoldering gun is doing much good as well what i did now is i basically used low melt solder to go through the via everywhere around the pin of the chip and then somehow i was able to loosen all seven pins on one side enough that I can push it a little bit away from the board and then I could continue removing the entire chip. But yeah, this was much harder than I thought. I don't know if you have a better method of doing that without necessarily using hot air. But yeah, I think hot air may actually be the best solution for this. So this was the chip that had the corrosion on. And as you can see under the chip, there is nothing okay that spot is now cleaned up and all the connections seem to be okay so let's try to get the orientation correct this is a seven pin ic so we need a seven pin socket let's see if this one works beautiful Okay, I cleaned the chip now. Unfortunately, I also removed a little bit of the markings. That doesn't mean that this chip is fake. This came on the motherboard. I highly doubt this chip is fake. And this probably will be the last one where we go through the full process of me desoldering and then going to the programmer and testing the chip. Okay, so let's try to test this logic chip. For this, I go to device and logic IC test, and it was a 4069. Let me just double check if this is written on the board. Yes, MC4069. So, and uh, we have different voltages to select here, so let's just quickly see a data sheet so here is a data sheet of the mc4069 this is very similar and this supports a supply voltage of 
3 to 18, so we should be fine, I guess. V in, VDD, this is VDD, so we should be safe for the pins as well. And what's interesting in this datasheet is that it says here it's a pin for pin replacement for the CD4069. This is actually how I came to know that the model number of this chip is A4069. So let's see what our programmer says. Test. All vector testing normal. So that means this chip can go back to our board. Okay, unfortunately, this is not our problem. But, you know, once I tested all of those logic chips, at least I will be able to say, yes, the board is not suffering from a bad logic chip. Right now, I can say that. Let's put this chip back on the board and continue with the next logic chip. So for the last 30 minutes or so, I have been working on these two chips. They are 74373s. And the first one, I used Soderwick, or at least I tried to use Soderwick to get it out. It took about 20 to 25 minutes. That is not the right tool for this type of work. For the second one, I used Hot Air, and it was a much better experience. So I want to continue to use Hot Air but I also don't want to heat cycle the board too much. So we will just go ahead and remove all four chips that are here in this corner. And then we will test them all together. I want to install sockets anyway. As you can see here, there is a socket already. This is for the crystal. And initially there was a 40 megahertz crystal in there, which is used to determine the speed of the 286. And I replaced this with a 30 megahertz crystal. Unfortunately, the board still behaves exactly the same. But anyway, I can now go ahead and have any type of crystal in here that can influence the speed of the CPU. Now, there are a few more chips that I need to replace later on. If we are not getting lucky with these seven chips here, no, six chips here in the bottom. So there are two more between these two ISA slots and there are three more here next to the keyboard controller. I don't think they make a difference because I think these two are linked or have something to do with the 287. Maybe this one here, this is a 74245. I heard these ones can fail. And there are a few traces going to the CPU. Maybe it has something to do with our memory problem that we have. But yeah, so far there is no news. The board still behaves exactly the same way. I will now use hot air to replace these four chips. And if this doesn't work, then I guess we have to continue to get these two chips that are between the ISA slots out. And then I'm going to check what is going on with this chip if we have no luck. Anyway, I want to socket all these chips anyway. It's much easier later on to replace them and test them if something should go wrong in the future. And let's see, maybe we are lucky and this board posts. I really hope that there is a way to get this board working. Uh, okay, then let's fire up the hot air station and see what we can do. The first thing I will do before attempting to remove these chips with hot air is to make sure that all these pins are straight. Because otherwise it will be so much harder to get this chip out of the board. I will set my hot air station to 350 degrees. And airflow is very low at only 20. So let's try to get more of these chips off. Let's try very slowly to increase the heat on the board. I hope that they will fall out just like this. And then we'll see. Okay. You can see that we have movement. 
and let's try to get it out. And the chip is out. Let's just continue with the next one. And yes, I can already see there is liquefied solder. So yeah, if you need to straighten pins right now, this is a little bit too late. So yes, this one moves already. There is a corner pin that is probably a little bit more difficult to get out. And here we go with the next chip. So let's see if we can get this one out. Yes, and it's already moving. So the board is already warm. And here we go. Maybe we can get this out immediately. No. Chip is out. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, all the spots for our ICs are clean now. I checked all the traces and they look all good. They're all connected. They're all cleaned up. I'll install sockets now. And then we test the chips. We have three chips that look to be identical. Those are 74373s. 74373. There we go. 74373. Okay, and we again have to check the voltage. I already found a data sheet. So these are octal D type three state transparent latch. No idea what that means. Important what I want to see is what is the voltage rating. And we have seven volts here so that. IC should be fine at 5 volts. So let's test from the top to bottom every single chip. And I'll place the first one in the programmer. Okay, the first one is in the programmer. Let's test. Okay, test okay and successful. Okay, second one. Test also works. Now comes the third 373. Okay, and test. Also normal. So the 373 seem to work. Now come two other chips. We have a 74244. Okay, we have these chips here as well, and the other one is a 74245. Okay, let's first test the 244. Octal buffer and line drivers with three state output. Again, 7 volts and input voltage 5.5, .5, so we can stay at 5 volts. There are significantly more logic tests here. Let's see. And the chip looks to be working normally. Okay, now let's test the 245, which is right here. So the 245, octal bus transceiver, supply voltage 5 volts and I guess that's it. So we'll try stay with 5 volts. Place our chip in our tester. The 245. Test normal. Now we have a 7404. Do we have a 04? Yes. This is a quite small chip. 
So quad two input NAND gate. A NAND gate. Typical five volts. Okay. So this should be fine. Okay, and test. Also good. So all the chips so far are in working condition on this board. I took out seven. Six right now and the other one that was closer to the battery, which also seems to be working. So I guess I will continue to remove chips and even though what we have seen before, some of those chips connect to the FPU socket, I still want to take them out and put them on a socket. And uh, then we have two left which are sitting between the ISA slots, but it has to be done anyway, so I will do this now. I'm done with removing all logic ICs and testing them in my programmer. Unfortunately, all of them seem to be working. And as you can see here, each of those chips got their own socket now. Even the ones between the two ISA slots. And these three, I think one of those chips I couldn't test. I don't know uh, which one it was. I think it's one of these two. One of those chips is not in the library of my programmer. But since all the other chips seem to be working fine, I guess it's very unlikely that this is the culprit. Yeah, and then the only other chip that maybe deserves a socket is the Harris chip. And by the way, here are two more chips. This was the first one that I removed. You can barely read what's written there. This is the hex inverter. And then here is another chip. So what other things are there that I could try? As you can see, I already have uh, different memory sticks here. If you look at their markings, they are made in Germany and they are 60 nanoseconds as specified in the datasheet for this board. So I don't think the memory is the issue. I tested these sticks as well, they are working. I showed you that I tried a different crystal here, which was a 33 megahertz crystal. I have others which I can still test, but this will probably come in the next video. I can still try to replace the Harris CPU. I think I have a 286 from AMD, uh, much slower though just in case the CPU is uh, the problem. But I would assume that if that would be the case, then we wouldn't get any postcodes. Maybe it is related to the real-time clock here, but for this I would need another chip to rule that out. And otherwise I think there is not much but the chipset that could be the problem. So let me show you what else I got. So this is something I actually spent quite some money on because you know that I get most of my stuff from the scrapyard and the chances that I find a similar 286 with a Harris CPU and a Headland chipset is very slim. So I went on to eBay and tried to find similar boards. So here is one and as you can see this is also an Octech or OC Tech motherboard with a Headland chipset. And we have here a 28616 from AMD. It also has a similar memory configuration. So we have SIM sockets and DIP sockets. No FPU installed. We have very similar looking BIOS chips. Most likely all these logic chips are the same and they're again all soldered to the board. But we have a real-time clock chip here, which is socketed. So this one would be an easy test to move to the other board. Uh, tantalum capacitors. Before I switch on this board, I'll definitely first get rid of the tantalum capacitor that's on the 12 volt rail. Yeah, so this is one board. But there is also a second board and this one, let's unpack this because otherwise the reflections of the light are too much. So what do we have here? 
Another Headland chipset. Same one that we have on our 286 board. And we also have a Harris CPU this time in a socket. And I think these are the two BIOS chips. This one here must be... What is this? <gasps> it has a floating point unit. Is this a floating point unit? Where's the? So here's the keyboard controller and this time it's soldered. The real time clock is soldered to the board. Yeah, this one has a little bit of corrosion and battery damage. And I think I've seen, yeah. So somebody tried to fix this board. Maybe this board is working. It was switched on and somebody tried to make this work. Let's see our tantalum capacitors. Hmm. Maybe, maybe we have to check this under the microscope, but oh yeah, the, the left three ones look the same. Then we have a bigger one and a smaller one. I don't know. And we have memory chips. Look at that. We have memory chips on this board. So yeah, now we have a lot more options to play with. Now we have three boards with the headland chipset and CPUs. So now it's your turn to let me know what you want me to do with these two extra boards. Should we first try to make them work and be 100% sure that we at least have one board that works? Because that would help me also to continue looking into EMS memory. If you haven't seen my previous video on MS-DOS memory management, specifically EMS memory, we emulated this all in software. But this chipset is supposed to be able to provide EMS memory through hardware. But yeah, for this we need to get at least one of those boards working. So let me know in the comments what we should do first. And then we will hopefully be able to figure out what is wrong with this board that I found at the scrapyard. And this is the end of this video. So thank you so much for your time, thanks for watching, leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video and a big shout out to all my Patreons. And thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.